I don't know if you've ever been to Galveston, Texas, but everything's on stilts because you can get flooding. You know, a tiny home on stilts just doesn't sound that interesting. So for our tiny, tiny, tiny home community here, you know, probably you really want to avoid most floods. Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live a tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 220 with Dave Deniston. Today on the show, we are talking land, and specifically raw land, even more specifically, cheap land. My guest, Dave Deniston, is actually a land broker of sorts. He finds great, inexpensive land around mostly the West and Southwest and makes sure that everything is good, clean title, etc., and then has built a portfolio of inexpensive properties that he is actually willing to then finance when he sells them to you. So in this episode, we go through all the basics of buying raw land, like what to look for, what pricing to look for, things to avoid. We also talk about what the tiny home friendly counties are around the country that that Dave has found in his extensive land buying and selling experience. And then we learn more about Dave's podcast. Uh, It's called the Land Stories Podcast, and it's a podcast all about buying land. I hope you stick around. Let's face it. Most tiny house dwellers want their tiny homes to be small, but not uncomfortable. That means reliable, unlimited hot water. Precision Temp's propane-fired hot water heaters reliably provide unlimited hot water, and they're specifically designed with tiny homes in mind. In fact, the NSP 550 model was installed in my own tiny home, and the reason I chose it was because it did not require a large hole in the side of my home like other RV hot water heaters. Instead, it mounts discreetly through the floor of the tiny house and works quietly and reliably. Right now, Precision Temp is offering $50 off any unit plus free shipping when you use the coupon code THLP. So head over to precisiontemp.com and use the coupon code THLP at checkout. All right, I am here with Dave Deniston of Generation Family Properties. Dave is a passionate owner and seller of raw, vacant, rural land. He got into the business of buying and selling land due to the desire for a better life for his family and particularly his youngest daughter, Evangeline, who was born less than a pound, 12.4 ounces to be exact, in 2012. A few years ago, he also started sharing his love of vacant land and do's and don'ts through his podcast, Land Stories. Dave Denniston, welcome to the show. Hey, Ethan. Glad to be here, man. Yeah, glad to have you. So, I was hoping, I always like to start with kind of your story, your backstory. Can you talk about, you know, your daughter, Evangeline, and, you know, why that led or how that led to you wanting to to do what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. So a, a little bit of background. I actually own several businesses. Okay. And um, so I've done financial planning forever, the last 20, 20 years of my career. And my daughter my youngest daughter, so I have two, two girls, uh, three girls, including my wife, mm-hmm. two girls. One is, is 17, about to finish up high school in the next year. And then my youngest is 10. She was mm-hmm. born 10 years ago. On Mother's Day in 2012, she was an extreme preemie. And mm-hmm. uh, we were just going through this whole process. My wife had toxemia that was diagnosed. Mm-hmm. And which can lead to seizures and, and all kinds of horrible things. And um, she had it with both kids, actually. But the second time, it came on really early. And so we had to come to this horrible decision of, do you leave her in there with the possibility, like, both of them could die, you know? Mm. And this was 23 weeks in gestation out of 40. Or do you take her out and take the chance that, okay, the wife's probably going to be okay. But then, you know, she's coming out so early that um, there's a higher likelihood that she doesn't make it versus she does. So Mm -hmm. we we took this huge leap of faith and said, okay, let's do it. And I'll tell you, having to explain that to my oldest daughter, who was six at the time, yeah, almost broke me, you know, just like, wow, it was, it was hard. A hard, hard moment in my life. And mm-hmm. so we get through it. 
And um, I'm there in the operating room as they take this teeny little thing out. You know, she, she was fully formed, but her skin was like translucent. They had to get mm-hmm. a little breathing tube down her throat in order for her mm-hmm. to breathe because her lungs weren't fully formed yet. And thank goodness the, the fellow stuffed that teeny weeny little tube down her teeny weeny weeny little throat. She made it. And it was, it was a lot of kind of touch and go for a while, but we were in the NICU, the, the neonatal intensive care unit for like four and a half months after mm-hmm. she was born. And wow. she just progressively slowly got bigger. You know, there's some scares along the way. Like she so had pneumonia growing down her tube at one time. Wow. And uh, this, this little girl has had to overcome a lot in her life. You know, she's constantly been behind other kids, whether it was growth physically, mentally, emotionally. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the reason I do what I do and into having multiple businesses is I want to make sure that she's going to be taken care of. Um, Luckily, Mm -hmm. she doesn't didn't have any brain hemorrhaging or intestinal issues or long term lung issues, but she still Mm -hmm. has a lot of kind of mental things she's working through. So who knows what she could become like the most amazing genius in the world. I don't know. But at, at this stage, I think wonder what, what her path is going to be. And so I'm incentivized yeah. to try and set her up as much as I can. As a matter of fact, she said, Dad, I want to work with you in land. So, you know, maybe she'll she'll be replacing me at some point. I, I don't know. But, yeah, you know, she's really been a driving force for me. And I actually, you mentioned Land Stories as a podcast that I've done. And as part of mm-hmm. that journey, I had a person that came onto my podcast that talked about buying and selling land. And that really turned me on to it. My, um, my parents used to, they have um, rental properties. And so I was exposed to real estate when I was really young. They helped me mm-hmm. manage one of them. And I can't even tell you during college how much I hated it. It was like the worst experience ever. And um, I am not a handy guy. That is not my skills. I know stuff. I'm an Eagle Scout, but I'm, I really don't do well with handy things. And so when we came across land, I realized, hey, I can learn about a property. I can do this all remote. It doesn't require me to build stuff. And uh, I can help people out. And it's been such a joy now. For the last five years, I've been doing that on top of, of other stuff. You know, we've sold hundreds of properties, just helping regular folks get a chance at owning a piece of the American dream, you know, having a, mm-hmm. a property that they're not crowded out around 5 billion other people where you can reach out your hand and touch someone else's wall, you know, just acres of space that we we've done all over the country so far. Awesome. Yeah. So can you talk a bit more about what generation family properties actually does kind of where in the pipeline of land are you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I I've been really thinking about kind of what, what we do. And I guess if I was to say it in in a quick way, I would say something Mm -hmm. like, you know, um, we help a lot of families kind of Midwest and Southwest. We don't do mm-hmm. so much in the Southeast or the Eastern part of the country mm-hmm. as much as the, the Midwest and Southwest, you know, really trying to make land affordable for people. Yep. So we do a lot of owner financing and easy monthly payments that allow people to start owning land, whether they want to build on it or they want to build, buy it for cash and just start, you know, mm-hmm. immediately or whatever, or they just want it recreationally, you know, maybe they mm-hmm. want to take an RV or, or a mobile tiny home out there, you know, every so often, you know, all those sorts of things, camp on it or just have land mm-hmm. just to have land. And maybe one day they'll yeah. do it. Yeah. And so um, does, does generation family, do you buy land and then, and then sell it to people? So you're kind of keeping your eyes out for good land and then, and then connecting people with it. Exactly. Yeah. So basically what we do, you know, as a, as a business, obviously we're not a nonprofit entity. We're in it, right, we're in right. it for a profit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we go and we have some places we've been buying land since the beginning of when I started. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And we continue to add more counties and more states and places where we buy and sell land. And, and essentially we keep on going back. And so yeah. we will send letters to people that currently own land. We sometimes buy liens through tax deed auctions or through mm-hmm. tax liens that get foreclosed. And so we acquire land in lots of different ways. And um, 
one way or another, you know, someone doesn't want a property anymore. And so we're coming in there and taking it off of their hands. In a lot of cases, it's been someone that's older. They're like 60, 70, 80 years old. They're like, my kids don't want this. I'm not going to build mm-hmm. out there like I thought I would. And so we come in and, and buy it off of them and at a steep discount relative to what we think the market rate is. In a lot of yeah. our case, a lot of our land that we buy is sub 50,000 bucks. Mm-hmm. And so a realtor isn't going to give a rip about right. a property under 50,000 bucks. And so, yeah, you know, yeah. that's where we come in and, and buy it. And, and uh, we typically, we're looking for all kinds of different criteria, which I'm sure we can talk more about, about how we decide, hey, we want this land, we don't want this land and so on. Yeah, well, let's, I mean, let's jump right into that. What What is the criteria? You know, because I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, uh, uh, the dream of, many of my listeners who are either living tiny already or planning to be living tiny is that they want to find a, an affordable place to park their tiny house and to live. Um, you know, most tiny house people don't necessarily want to be mobile. They want to put down roots. They want to have a piece of land or a place to rent that they can call their own. Um, my hunch is that renting a spot is is what most people do simply because they don't think that they can afford to own a spot. Um, yeah. So, what are some of the criteria that you're that you're looking for when you're when you're looking at raw land? Yeah, absolutely. So, even you know what what we do is first we kind of identify a county. Mm-hmm. This this looks like a good county. So we go through some some filtering initially to say, hey, how affordable is land here? We're we're not currently at least in the business of trying to put hundreds of thousands of dollars into a property. We want to buy something that other people can easily afford. So right. uh, we, we often filter by price. So you can go on a website like Lands of America or Land Watch, and you could put in criteria. Oh, hey, here, yep. one acre to five acres mm-hmm. in, in this state. You know, where are the cheapest places that you could buy? Land in. Right. You know, could put on prices in there, one thousand to ten thousand bucks. So that's where we start. Mm-hmm. And then after we've identified the county, we will then start mailing maybe a subdivision or an acreage size, and we'll start sending letters out. People start responding to the letters. Okay. Properties come in, and quite honestly, like it's a whole range of property. Like we don't know what we're gonna get <laughs> when it comes yeah. back to us. Yeah. And so um, once it comes to us, then we start doing a due diligence process. And some of the okay. first things we start looking for is, does it have legal access? Which what that means is that, could you build on a property if you wanted? And more often than not, legal access, if you look on a county GIS map, which is an online mapping system that most counties provide, then mm-hmm. you could see a platted street okay. in between that parcel and the one across the street, if you will. If you see a bunch of parcels that are all, you know, squares that are all right next to one another, there's a really good chance that there's not legal access. Now, there might be legal access if there's an easement or something like that. But I find more times than not, you have to have that little platted street, that little strip of a road mm-hmm. that is there. So that's one of the first things we look for. Second thing we look for is going to be, is there physical access? Meaning the street is there, but is it like maintained or not? Does it exist in real life? Does it exist? Exactly. And, and is it, you know, do you need a four by four to get out there? Yeah. Yeah. And we're not against buying properties that don't have physical access, but Mm -hmm. they're going to be far cheaper. So if, if we found out when we priced it based on, oh, we thought it was going to be better physical access, we'll knock down our price than what we thought it was. And so we'll end up selling a property much cheaper because it doesn't have physical access. So just because it doesn't have physical access doesn't mean we're going to knock mm-hmm. it out um, because it means it can sell it really, really cheap, which for the right person might be a good, a good fit for them. Right. But legal access is incredibly important to us. It's very, very rare that we'll buy a property without legal access. That's a must because most of our, our people, they don't just want land to have land. They want to build on it. They want to camp on it. They want to take an RV out there or something yep. Yep. You know, to, to get away and do actually something with the land. 
Because if you don't have legal access, you can't do anything with it. Sure. The next thing that we usually do outside of that is we start using, we use a tool called MapRight, just like mm-hmm. it sounds, M-A-P-R-I-G-H-T. And this is a paid tool. You can usually get a uh, free subscription for for like nine days or something. And mm-hmm. we'll pull it up on there and we looked for a few things. Like, is it in a flood zone? Is it in a wetland? You know, you want to be aware of those things. They may not stop you from building, but it can make building a lot more expensive. Because if it's wetlands, you might have right. to mitigate the wetlands. Right. If, if it's in a flood zone, it might mean like, I don't know if you've ever been to Galveston, Texas, but everything's on stilts in Galveston. Right. Because right. you can get flooding. You know, a tiny home on stilts just doesn't sound that interesting. So for our tiny, tiny, tiny home community here, you know, probably you really want to avoid most flood zones. But, you know, some place yeah. like Florida, you know, like a lot of it is wetlands and flood zones. So, sure. and people still build on it, but it just depends on the type and the county regulations and what kind of flood zone or wetlands. Generally, we try to avoid those. Or again, yeah. we're not against buying it, but we got to buy it super cheap. And we end up passing that on, you know, at the end of the day to um, an end consumer that, that might not mind it and might overcome it. And they just want to buy a cheaper. Right. Other things you have to watch out for, like in um, Arizona, for example, it's mo- pretty dry in Arizona, a lot of it, right? You think a desert. Yeah. But when it rains, it can rain hard. and you get these things called washes. And so you just like with flood zones, you have to be aware of washes. Like it looks like there would be a river there when you look at it on like a GIS map. And so you have to be aware, is this in a wash or not? Other things that we start thinking about here too would be like, is there electricity nearby? Is this on-grid, off-grid mm-hmm. kind of property? Are there any other yeah. utilities available? Most of the time, for most of our properties, a lot of them are off-grid, but some are on-grid. You might get some of the utilities. Ones with utilities are going to be more expensive. Right. Some other things on our checklist. We want to know the GPS coordinates. You know, the, uh, how large is it? So we might double-check measurements. I feel like I'm just talking on here, Ethan. So please. Uh, no, this is all. This is all great. I just hope that that whoever you know, if you're listening and you're looking for land for your tiny house, I hope you're taking notes because like there's just so many things to consider that that you might not have thought of, and and just the tools that you're mentioning, like MapRite, you know, looking for the county GIS map through through the town planning office or or something like that. Those are just all great great tips. And then um, something else that is very very important that we do is talk to the planning and zoning department. And it's called different mm-hmm. things at different places. So yeah, like in Oregon, they call it community development. Colorado, they call it planning and zoning. But essentially the question is, what do they allow you to do on your property? How is it zoned? Mm-hmm. And so um, some might be zoned like agricultural one, which by the county's definition, there's like Anything you could do on the property, there's no minimum square footage size, which is important for tiny homes that, you know, you can put a 200 square foot plate. You want to, might want to know, can you have chickens on? Can you um, have a horse on it? Can you have a cow on it? You know, all of these questions, which uh, people ask us, we try and answer those questions ahead of time uh, by talking to planning and zoning. How many structures can you put on it? Can you camp on it? We take an RV on it, whatever restrictions are. And so every municipality is different. And then on top of that, you layer in there's even in land, there's HOAs out there. So then some HOAs have rules and you just have to get familiar yep. with that. Got it. Yeah. And and HOAs can often be the enemy of of tiny homes. This is true. Yeah. I mean, so <laughs> yeah. many of them, most of them I've ran into, I'd say probably are like six hundred square foot minimum. Right. If not a thousand, which <laughs> definitely yeah. take, takes out tiny homes. And for sure, some for sure. counties like um, I've done a lot of business in Costilla County, Colorado. OK, it doesn't matter where you are in the county. It's 600 square foot minimum. That's mm. their rule. So a whole as you do your research and kind of dig into it, you know, if I was someone that wanted to have a tiny home 
you know, I would probably start with the pricing stuff I talked about just to have an idea of how much does it cost for the size of property that I want in a state. Yeah. And then I would contact the county to make sure that it's tiny home friendly in terms of right. planning. Yeah. What do you see as some of the, the biggest benefits of purchasing raw land? Well, I think, I think Ethan, you know, in terms of the benefits, well, you know, there's um, there's a lot of things that you can buy and they go down in value, right? Uh-huh. You go and you buy a car, you know, the second you drive that off the lot, you've just lost money. And every right. day you right. drive it, you're losing money. Yeah. With land, hey, it's not going anywhere. They're not making any more of it, except maybe in Hawaii. And, uh-huh. you know, it's um, it, it's something that has generally tracked, if not beat inflation over time. So it, it is an mm-hmm. investment of sort. Of course, it's not like a stock or a bond. You can just sell tomorrow, you know, on an open market. Right. You know, it does take some time and effort and, and energy to sell one day when you want to sell it. Got it. Besides that, I mean, obviously, there's so many different things that you can do with it. Whether you want to mm-hmm. improve it, you want to put septic on it, put a well on it, you want to clear a camping spot, you want to plant trees, you know, you can really make it all yours, you know, in terms of how you want the land to be. Um, so yeah. it's, it's for me, you know, it's all about helping people achieve that dream, that vision. Oh man, to have two acres or five acres to spread out on is, is pretty awesome to have people say, I've been dreaming about this my whole life. And you can help them out with that. There's nothing more rewarding I can think of. Nice. I asked John and Finn Kernahan of United Tiny House Association what they love about their precision temp hot water heaters. And here's what they told me. Hey, Ethan, uh, this is uh, John and Finn Kernahan with the United Tiny House Association. We organize tiny house basketball. Oh, yeah, I guess so. First and foremost. <laughs> we have a total of three precision temp uh, on-demand hot water heaters. The, the thing we really like about these, and, and, and folks know this, I think they picked this up on Finn and I, if we don't like something, you'll never hear us talk about it. So the two things we noticed uh, that, that we noticed and experienced immediately, uh, they took painstaking effort to make sure that it was done right and installed. And so that, that was pretty cool right there. The other thing is the continuous on-demand hot water that just ran forever without any fluctuations or anything. I, I can't imagine an application, especially in our environment and our lifestyle of uh, being the, the, the nomad, uh, transportable, mobile, uh, tiny lifestyle where um, one of these units aren't um, uh, good to use. So, you know, in terms of, so if it's raw land and we're talking raw, like there's nothing on it, um, you know, some big costs, at least in the Northeast, um, which is where, where I am can often be clearing out the trees, you know, for wherever your house site might be. Um, and then also if there aren't utilities, you know, bringing power in from the street can be really expensive. Um, and also, you know, coming up with a water source, putting in a well can also be rather expensive. Do you have a way of kind of estimating those costs or, or evaluating a piece of land with the, with the assumption that those costs are going to have to go in at some point? Well, here's, here's what I would do. You know, if, mm-hmm. if I were in the situation of, of wanting to build specifically mm-hmm. um, and do some of the things you were talking about. Um, once again, things just vary so much from region to region. Yeah. Like, for example, in Mojave County, Arizona, it's like, I think it's, I don't know, a hundred bucks to get like a thousand gallons of water hauled to you. Whereas in Costilla County, Colorado, it's like 250 bucks. It's two and mm-hmm. a half times the cost. And that's just that one teeny little thing, you know, so it's so regionally dependent on where you are yeah. at. You know, obviously, if you have trees, like in the Northeast, if you're in Maine or someplace like that, or New Hampshire or Washington mm-hmm. State or Minnesota here, you know, it could cost a fair amount to clear versus one that's yep. already cleared out or more, is more grassy in nature. Yeah. Yep. 
You can always plant more trees is what I tell people. You know, you can always plant trees in the ground if you want, you know, if you really right, want Right, right. But you're right. It is expensive. There are certain things you can do, you know, like you have to think about what are your needs. So getting septic, for example. Well, how large yeah. of a tank do you really need? You know, mm -hmm. there's obviously all kinds of systems and things available. Depending upon the area where you're at and the size of land that you buy, you might be forced to buy an alternative septic that's far mm -hmm. more expensive versus traditional septic if your land right. is perking or not perking. So th there's a lot that goes into it. I would yeah. say as a general rule of thumb, you know, the larger your property, the less these issues are going to be. So a five acre property is going to be have a way larger chance of perking versus a quarter acre property. You know, a quarter acre, you have to be really cognizant of uh, how much does perking cost and can you perk on it? versus five acres. Well, now you have, what is that, 20 <laughs> a quarter acre, you know, parcels yeah. in one. Yeah. So you want to be cognizant of that. In terms of water, you want to think about, you could drill for a well, but might it be cheaper if you just had a cistern and water hauled to you? Mm -hmm. Or is that just a temporary solution while you get the money to drill for a well? And right. then again, how large of a tank do you need? And what are your needs in terms of water every month? So if you're single and don't have a family, you're not going to need nearly as much water as if you have, you know, six kids. You know, your needs are going to go up that much more. Everything gets more expensive. So yep. Yep. you, you got to keep all of that in context. It, it may not make sense to have a cistern if you have, you know, uh, a partner and six kids. You know, like you might as well just mm -hmm. drill for a well because your needs are going to be so much. Having water hauled to you every week ain't going to make sense. So right, right. everyone's situation is different. Certainly, like in Colorado, you go up into the mountains, it's much more expensive to drill for a well because the rocks are that much harder and difficult to get through. And the water table is so much lower down into the ground. If you go into the valleys in Colorado, well, you don't have all the beautiful trees, but to get to water, it's like 120 feet versus the 400 or 500 feet up in the mountain. So depending upon the rock structure and you know, all of those stuff, all of those things come into play. And a lot of time it's a give and take. You know, you're giving up, you're getting trees, but you're giving up, you know, easy to get to water. Got it. Or, you know, you're, you're getting a larger lot, which is awesome. But then you have not all of the, the uh, usually the smaller lots have closer access to electricity or utility. Mm -hmm. So you might be giving up that utility access that you might get in a smaller lot, uh, which of course, you know, everyone says, you know, Dave, I want a five acre parcel, trees on it, stream running through it with all the utilities on it for $5,000. You know, that, yeah. that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's, right, not, right. that's not reality. That does not exist. I'm sorry to say, you know, it's, it's all trade-offs here. Yeah, exactly. The, the, more, the more you get, the more you're going to pay. It, it makes sense. But just like, the difference in I, like looking at some properties on the site, just clicking through, um, you know, looking at some beautiful properties in New Mexico that are less than ten thousand dollars, just like kind of blowing my mind. Here, sitting in Vermont, where like the cost of land has just exploded through the pandemic, as I'm I'm sure it has in in many places, and just realizing that if you're less tied to a specific state or a specific location and you're more open to being somewhere else and it's the, really the land itself that's drawing you in you can really find things that are are very very affordable absolutely absolutely and, and that's why we specialize in more the midwest and southwest you know, yeah if you, yeah if you uh, even places like texas that used to be cheap yeah. have just skyrocketed mm -hmm. and I know for me, stuff I used mm -hmm. to buy for a thousand bucks. Now we have to buy for three thousand bucks. You know, yep. like the, our, right, our which still sounds really cheap, but that is a three x increase. <laughs> yes, yes, sir, <laughs> absolutely. Is there, um, you know, is there a price per acre, for example, that you just like for your business just don't go over? Are you? Is there like a sweet spot in pricing that you're looking for? 
Well, you know, um, when, when we buy land, our money is going into it. Right. So right. like I've always taken the attitude. I would rather have more properties than less. I have friends that are in the same business that, you know, mm-hmm. they would rather have less properties, but higher dollar amounts, which yep. is a lot more risk. You know, you buy something for sure. 50, 80 grand and you're hoping, you know, to make 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 bucks on it. You know, it's a lot more mm-hmm. risk. So I've mm-hmm. always felt I would rather help more people than less. Yep. Certainly, I hope to get more larger dollar properties as time goes on. And we continue to go after those, but I'm very selective about what I'm what I'm going to buy. When you're as an entrepreneur, you know you're taking that amount of risk that sure. you don't know if it's going to sell or not. And in this sure. world today, you know who the heck knows what'll happen tomorrow. So yeah, yeah. So are there some kind of tiny home friendly counties that you've you've come across that you like to buy land in? Yeah, yeah. So um, in the Southwest for example, we've done a lot in Mojave County, Arizona. So Uh Mojave County in particular is very tiny home friendly. They're even like earthship Uh friendly and uh, whatnot. And even if you have a tiny home on wheels, if you get septic installed, you could live in Mm -hmm. it too. Mm -hmm. So I like Mojave County a lot for that. Mojave County, for those that don't know, is in the Northwest corner of Arizona. So you're like an hour and a half from Vegas probably depending where you're at in the county, two and a half hours from Phoenix, you're bordering California. So it is very deserty, you know, so for a a snowbird, you know, you want to get away from Vermont and and get, (laughs) get warmed up over the winter time. You know, it's a a great place for that. During this time of the year, it starts to be pretty hot. You know, if you love hot weather, it's great for you, but you know, you do get a lot of nineties, you know, this time of of the year. Mm -hmm. Another County I like a lot, which actually we don't even have any properties there right now. That is tiny home friendly is Cibola County, New Mexico. Okay. So Cibola County is another great place, very low in the way of restrictions. There's some smaller properties out there in a few subdivisions that we like a lot. Mm-hmm. So I like that one quite a bit, as well as Apache County, Arizona is mm-hmm. very friendly, tiny home wise. You know, they don't have a lot of restrictions on size out there for mobile tiny homes or for if you want to actually, you know, have it on a foundation. Yep. Yep. Um, In Colorado, one place that we've bought and sold quite a bit of land that is tiny home friendly, but you have to have a foundation on it is Park Mm -hmm. County. Park County is a little more expensive. You're closer to Denver and Colorado Springs, probably like two hours from Denver. You're like an hour, hour and a half from Colorado Springs, where you're at in the county. So they just have like a 200 square foot minimum. So they're very tiny home friendly. I think here in Minnesota, I believe we have a couple of properties right now in St. Louis County, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So if you're wanting to escape away from the heat and you're in Arizona or someplace like that, we are very tiny home friendly here too. Nice. There's no minimum square footage to build in St. Louis County. So that's been a great county for me. And those, that's kind of my experiences off of where we're buying and selling land. Fantastic. Yeah. Those, you know, again, I hope, I hope you're listening. You're taking notes. We'll, uh, for the show notes, on this episode, we'll list out, you know, those counties that you mentioned so that, that people can, can find those. But, um, looking at, at gen fam, you know, it looks like in terms of the pricing, I noticed that, that you are offering, you know, you can essentially finance the properties for people and that you're oftentimes listing. Like when I see a property that says like starting at $99 a month, what does that mean? Is that, is that a mortgage payment? Is that, is that a rent to own situation? Like how is that all structured? Yeah. Yeah. Great question, Ethan. So we do owner financing where mm-hmm. people aren't renting, they're building equity into it. Mm-hmm. So saying it's a mortgage would be a good parallel, but instead of a bank offering the financing, it's me, me personally, yep. I am financing yep. you. And yep. so we have on our website minimum. So 249 mm-hmm. minimum, 
and 99 a month or 149 a month or whatever, depending upon the property. Yep. That's the bare minimum I'm looking for. And so yep. the way that I do financing is, is I want you to be incentivized to pay the thing off as quickly as possible. Right. If you buy it in cash rather than owner financing, we usually give you a thousand or maybe $2,000 discount relative to owner financing. And if you do do nice. owner financing, we set the interest rate. And so the way we do it is, let's say like it's a $3,000 property. Right. And you're going to put down 1500 bucks. That's 50% down on the property. And then you're going to finance the rest. You're going to do 150 a month in, in a year. And that pays it off. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. don't charge any interest in that case. So 0% mm -hmm. interest. If someone finances it over two years, we charge a 5% interest rate. Mm -hmm. Three years or four years, we do an 8% interest rate. And then five years or longer, we do 10%. So mm -hmm. the longer you finance, the more expensive the interest rate is going to be. Yep. And the lower the amount of time you finance, the cheaper it's going to be for you. Now, of course, you can pay it off anytime. There's no prepayment penalties, which some folks prefer. Hey, let's do, uh, do uh, just keep it cheap and do the lowest possible payment. That's totally fine. And we can do that. Um, some folks would rather just knock it out early. So it's all about you and what works for you. It's, uh, we'd like to make it as easy as possible for folks yep. you know, to, yep. to get in and, and do it. And um, you know, honestly, in, in many cases for us, we don't even actually make money mm -hmm. on a property until like two plus years of payments quite often. Right. So you know, it depends on the property. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it's, it, for us, we're investing in you. As well as you investing in us, right? We we want to make sure someone's a great long term fit and that they're good on payments. And, you know, it's not not a huge issue for us. So yeah, uh, we do have a company policy. Um, if if you talk to different land investors, some will say you cannot build at all while you while you are paying. Mm -hmm. We took a policy of we want to give people a chance, but we don't want to get screwed over of yep. having people leave a bunch of junk on a property that they started building. Mm -hmm. So we say that you have to make a minimum of six months worth of payments. As a matter of fact, I'm probably going to start making it nine months or 12 months because we have gotten screwed over a mm -hmm. couple of times by people that weren't treating the properties nicely and then stopped paying and then left junk and stuff. Right. And then you've so, got a property that you need to, to clean out. And we're getting letters from the county saying, hey, we're going to start finding you money, which is not. That's not good. Fun. No, no. So. Uh, that that does happen to us. It's not a lot of fun, but it's the risk of being in the business, sure. and uh, we're we're willing to take that risk to give allow people to build. And that's the reason why so many people come to us. They want to be able to build on a property. And I'm happy to do it if someone's good at paying us on time and mm -hmm. they're trustworthy and we have a good relationship. Got it. Got it. Um, how how long have you been in the business, or how long has Generation Family Properties been been going for? Five years now. Nice. So it's, it's our five, five year anniversary this year. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and like how many properties do you have available for sale right now? I mean, does right it, this yeah. minute, as of today, yeah. we have 55 okay. on the website. Nice. All, all over the country. And we're, we're getting, getting more every, every day. Of course, the inventory changes on a daily basis. Yep. You know, we have some people buying. Uh, we have sometimes people that default on payment. Yep. So, you know, something you see today may not be here tomorrow. Yep. But right this moment, we have 50 plus. Got it. And it sounds like, you know, do you ever work with people? Like if there's somebody listening who's like, okay, I, you know, Mojave County, Arizona sounds really interesting. Um, but I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing a property there that is like quite what I'm looking for. Here are my criteria. I want to let somebody else do the all this due diligence work of like checking the title, checking the easements, the the access, all that stuff. Um, do you work with people to to find land? Yeah, well, we, we certainly try to, but quite honestly, like the best thing people can do is just get on our emailing list, just because we literally have like five thousand people on our on our list. So. Okay. To, to focus just for one person, I'd love to. Yep. But there's just so many properties and so much going on. I just frankly don't have the time. Got it. You know to 
to help one person unless they say, hey, do you have anything that has this? We can let yeah. you know yeah. what we have available and then stay on our emailing list because more than likely we might come to find something that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we do tag people in our system. So if someone says, I want something in Arizona, I want something with trees or whatever, yep. we do have a way of keeping track of that in our CRM yep. so that we can pull a list of people to specifically email them for something. But if someone says, I want it specifically in this part of the county and, you know, this little corner with, you know, all, all this stuff that that's a little harder for us to keep keep track of. But mm-hmm. in general, you know, if someone can tell us what counties they're interested in, states, size, nice trees or no trees, you know, we, we can definitely tag someone so that we know, hey, this is the kind of thing that they're interested in. Then we can email everybody that's interested in that particular thing Yep. Uh, when we have something that pops up. Nice. Nice. Well, um, you are a podcaster as well. You do the land stories podcast. And I was, I was hoping or wondering, you know, is there an episode or two that are either favorites of yours or just like a good kind of intro to the show that you you'd recommend to our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Ethan. Well, uh, thank you for um, allowing me to, to plug it for a minute. You know, we've, um, We've been at this for a few years. We normally do an episode twice a month. And so we have about 80 episodes nice. out, something like that, are going to be out. So there's a lot to choose from. Mm-hmm. I suggest, you know, if, if someone is looking to understand some of the basics, I would actually start with the first few episodes. Okay. Uh, because we talk about uh, the chain of title. We talk about how to find GPS corners, how to check mm-hmm. for liens, mm-hmm. um, how to check for scams, you know, which is something a lot of people are concerned. You know, how do you know that this is a legitimate deal? We walk people through that. Mm-hmm. So all of those kinds of episodes, I think, would be great. Which, nice. Uh, is it a scam is episode seven. How to find the GPS coordinates is episode 10. Nice. Chain of title is episode 14. Mm -hmm. So all of those would be wonderful ones to do. And we also have part of what I'm trying to do is is talk to people that have developed land Mm -hmm. and bought land. And we've had a number of our clients on. Nice. But if someone in this audience is listening and they've developed land, we would love to have you on the story to talk about what has your journey been? What what have been the good things, bad things? How did you select the land? Yep. So if anyone's here is listening, I would love to have you on the show to talk about your journey. And because uh, I, I feel the best way people can learn is from others, right? Yeah. You know, we can talk about some of the basics, but people's stories are so important. Totally, totally. Well, I'm looking forward to being on the show myself. I think that's coming up and, and that'll be after this episode com- comes out. But at, at some point, I'll go back and update the show notes page with with a link to, to my interview on land stories. Uh, awesome. So uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you is um, where's your dream land? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I think um, for me, Ethan, I do love trees. Uh So I think um, probably I want something that, that is close to water, Mm -hmm. you know, lake, it doesn't have to be right on the property, but um, something where there's water nearby. Mm -hmm. So here in uh, Minnesota, I really like Crow Wing County. Mm -hmm. There's so many lakes out there. And so you have a lot of, a lot of uh, land that's close to water. Mm -hmm. So that's a favorite place of mine. Of course you do, you do get some colder weather up here. So if I was to, to try and find a more year round place that doesn't get as cold. Um, New Mexico would probably be high up on my list. There's some beautiful forested land in New Mexico, more expensive okay. in general, but I would try and find a place in New Mexico near a lake. It would probably be my most ideal spot. Nice. Um, high up in the mountains, Red River area is gorgeous up there. I love mountains. I love trees. Yep. I love water. Yep. So, Something with all of that would be wonderful, but not too crazy cold. Yeah. With tons of snow. Yeah. And how, like, are you traveling to these places to look at these properties or, or at this point, are you kind of 
you know these areas and you're and you're able to do most of this from from Minnesota. Yeah, yeah. Well, um with 50 something properties all over the country, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's 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 no way I'm going to see all of them. You know, as, yeah. uh, with every business as you grow it, which we've been blessed with mm-hmm. growing mm-hmm. and and helping lots and lots of people. There's only so much I can do right. as as the the owner of the the business. So I have sure. different staff doing different things and we have photographers that we go back to again and again and again Mm -hmm. that will help us take pictures, analyze properties, take a look at it for us. Um, Sometimes we don't even take pictures of properties if we know the area well. Mm -hmm. You know, if we've been back there a bunch of times, we don't need to get more pictures of the same area we've gotten like a hundred, a hundred times already. So sometimes we don't even get pictures if we know it well, but if we don't know it well, or we feel that, we we need more pictures of of this parcel or it's unique or different or something mm-hmm. about it. We always get someone to check it out in uh, in those cases. But no, I I probably in hundreds of them. I've probably personally been to thirty or so. Wow, that's quite a few. It is quite a few here in Minnesota. I've probably you know checked out ten. I've been to probably ten in Oregon and probably another ten to fifteen in Colorado. Nice. Nice. Well, uh, one last thing that I like to ask all my guests is, is what's two or three resources that kind of helped you learn about buying and selling land um, that you w- could recommend to our listeners? Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, one, of, one of the guys that I really respect mm-hmm. in the educational space his name is Seth Williams. Okay. He has a blog mm-hmm. and a uh, podcast retipster.com. I actually was on, on his podcast, I don't know, three years ago or something. It's been a long time. Mm-hmm. So Seth is great, super ethical guy, great education on land mm-hmm. and buying and selling land. So I would highly, highly recommend him. I think certainly um, on YouTube, you know, there's lots and lots of, of great resources. Yeah. Yep. Uh, a few of the people that are my competitors that I follow um, that I think do some good work on education. Um, I'm looking it up here. Gokey Capital, G-O-K-C-E, mm-hmm. um, Capital. They do a really great job with education. I think I put out a lot of education. They do even more than I do. Yeah. So they, they have lots of great education there. And um, outside of those two, um, there's, there's a few books on, um, on land. Right this moment, nothing's coming to my mind. If I think of it, I'll, I'll email it to you. Sure. But there, there are some, some, uh, some books as well. And obviously, there's all of our educational content that people can check out with land stories and the the podcasts and blogs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and and, and it really looks extensive. Just looking through the 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 eighty or so podcast episodes, there's just a wealth of of different topics that I'm kind of oh, I want to listen to that one. I want to listen to that one. Um, just to, to learn more and, and kind of, it seems like with land, especially in, in a more competitive market, it's like, if you know what you want and you know what to look for and you're ready to kind of jump on it, that's, that's probably the best, the best scenario to be in. It's a lot, lot like the housing market just then, you know, it's very competitive out there right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that'll change. You know, I think as with anything, it's, it's good to jump in and get your feet wet and get going. Yep. Because who knows, you know, inflation can use to go up, land mm-hmm. values and house values certainly could continue to go up. Yeah. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised in the next year or two, we have, you know, recession of mm-hmm. some sort mm-hmm. or mild recession, which could lead to you be able to buy stuff at lower prices than it is right there now. There you go. So who knows? Awesome. Well, Dave Denniston, thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. This was really educational and just you're, you're an awesome guest and thanks for laying it all out for us. Well, thank you, Ethan. It's so fun to be here. Anyone feel free to reach out with any, uh, any questions. If, if you want to look at specific properties, you definitely can contact my sales gal, mm-hmm. Christy. I mean, her email is sales, S A L E S at Jen G E N fam, F A M land.com. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put links to all that, um, on the show notes for this, for this episode too. All right. Well, thank you, Ethan. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. 
Thank you so much to Dave Denniston for being a guest on the show today. You can find the show notes, including a complete transcript, links to Gen Fam Properties and the Land Stories podcast, and so much more over at thetinyhouse.net slash 220. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash 220. Well, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and I'll be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.